evening. And welcome. Uh, happy New Year, guys. So, uh, this is the first time getting back uh, in the New Year. So people that haven't, so don't worry, we've, we've not been deadly or January. Uh, so, happy New Year. Welcome back to the pub, as always. Uh, joined my fellow landlord, Rich Ginn. Good evening, Rich. Good evening, Nick. And hello, Jess. I'm glad to be back after all this time off from the end. Definitely, definitely. And as Rich just alluded to there, we have our special VIP patron this evening, uh, and that's our friend Jess Lomas from Single Track Nation. Good evening, Jess. Hello, good evening, guys. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to be in this pub. Uh, <laughs> even though it's you... the idea of telling people today I'm going to the pub, and people are like, what? <laughs> Where are you? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. We have a cheap taxi ride home as well. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, and you don't have to queue for the kebab shop either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Pakora comes to the door. I don't even need to go out for it. It's perfect. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> it's the perfect. So, even tomorrow, how are you, pal? Uh, so, tonight, guys, uh, we've got Jess with us. We're going to touch on uh, who Jess is a little bit later on, who she works for. And then get into the general uh, flow of life uh, and what we would chat about in the pub normally. Uh, so we've had a bit of a busy month so far, Rich, haven't we? What, what, what have we done this month so far? I think we've, uh, I think we've done three, three to four sort of shows a, a week or tastings here or there, which is uh, quite a lot for what's supposed to be dry January. But I guess yeah. people staying at home, it's a little bit more difficult to have the, the discipline, I suppose. But uh, um, some gin tastings with Fortnum and Mason. Um, a few uh, whiskey tastings with private clubs and uh, yeah, other live shows. We had uh, Vin from No Nonsense Whiskey join us yesterday for a, a yeah. core rape and, and Grunta Te green tea tasting, um, which is really good. And we had some excellent interaction on that as well. It was uh, that's about as close as you can get to feeling like you're in the pub or, or doing a tasting in person and getting comments in and questions. It really uh, it helps. Yeah, I think makes it fun for everybody. Right. Yeah. So we've had a busy week. Jess, what about yourself? Have you had a busy week, Paul? Yeah, pretty busy. I'm quite glad that it's Friday night and I don't know, I don't need to think about anything. Just ignore those emails till Monday. Or the, <laughs> off, you know, my office being this. Um, yeah, I've travelled really far to be here, guys. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's always a big trek down to the pub for us, do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> I had to put on the snow boots and everything this week as well, do you know what I mean? So yeah. make sure everything was, was prepped for the pub, dig, out, dig us out the snow, make sure we can get in through the front door. <laughs> oh dear so what have we got so we've got uh we've got a, a busy couple of weeks coming up as well we've got a big valentine show happening on february the 10th uh there's some packs available for that or coming to be available for that soon on macmira.co.uk um what else have we got rich we've got burns, burns, burns night. Night. yes how can i forget yeah. that so we have our <laughs> swedish twist uh on burns night uh, on monday the 25th uh, so that that would be the next time we're on screen, actually, with, with the lovely Moa from Swedish Whiskey Girl. Um, we're going to cover a, one of Burns's poems. Uh, I think we're going to do uh, "Address to a Haggis," uh, all eight verses of it, but broken down. So we're going to do that uh, along with uh, some drums, uh, our core range, and Svensk Ruk Amerikanskiek. Uh, I believe we're going to we're going to finish that one off with as well. There might even be an appearance by a haggis as well. So. <laughs> So that should be interesting. So, yes, yeah, so we've got some good stuff coming up, guys. Uh, but it's about that time. Yeah. So that, there's the, there's the, it must be about 18.05. Uh, so that's the bell. So it's mine and Rich's round. What are we having? Jess, what are you having to drink this evening, my friend? So I wasn't sure whether how, how much I should try and butter you two up. <laughs> uh, shamelessly starting with a mech mirror or shamelessly starting with my own stuff in a true act of nepotism. Uh, <laughs> But I think I'm going to start with my own stuff. And then I'll come to you. So I've got a little selection of Magmira hiding underneath uh, the table, as it were. Um, but I'm going to start with a bottle from my new release, which cool. is a really great, really great advertising opportunity because it's all sold out. So I'm just drinking this really to upset everybody who's emailed me this week to say where I can buy it. And I've replied saying, no way. Oh, check the auctions in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to start with our um, release. Uh, second release, um, it's an Aberfeldy 28-year-old single cask. Nice. 
Aberfeld is always quite close to my heart, what with it being my first ever distillery tour when I first got into drinking whiskey all those or a good couple of years ago. It must be about 11, 12 years ago now. Uh, my first distillery tour, Jewish World of Whiskey. Uh, so yeah, Aberfeldy always close to my heart. And the 21 was my first ever proper wow whiskey. You know, the first one I thought, this, this surely, this, this isn't the whiskey that I grew up with. What happened mm. to this stuff? Why wasn't this stuff knocking about at the time, you know? And what about yourself, Rich? What have you got in your glass this evening, sir? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going straight in for a, for a Mac Nera, but, uh, but I do have some single cast nation bottles next to me. And uh, usually we're, 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 we said, I think when we started this, you know, we try and sort of drink Mac Nera and we do it, but our boss is on holiday this week. So he's probably not watching tonight. I'll and, be watching. Um, <laughs> and i've been i've been listening to uh to the one nation under whiskey podcast you know the, the other thing that you guys do for so long that i thought um it, it would, i'd be remiss were i not to have a single cast nation bottle at some point so i've got two next to me that i'll probably get to after this but i'm starting on the mac mirror heard the tid the skirt the tid heard the tid if you watched i don't know if, if you managed to see our show with moa um swedish whiskey girl the translation show um we had, we had great fun with her learning how to or trying to learn at least how to say these things well, the thing uh, jess can join in with that because her <laughs> partner is swedish and she's uh, also learning swedish as well i was so. um, well i was so i was quietly winding up mickey during that asking him to ask moa to pronounce certain words and now oh. i'm gonna backfire on me spectacularly <laughs> words and expect me to be excellent yes why, why do you think i invited john <laughs> I could, at about three o'clock this afternoon, it suddenly occurred to me I should be calling various Swedish people and getting them to record words so I could re repeat them back at you. Um, <laughs> SK is really hard to pronounce for English speakers because it's like a like a sh noise rather than like a hard sound. Yeah, yeah. So what looks like it should be straightforward, it's not. And I also find that every time I try and speak any Swedish, I get laughed at immediately. So don't worry, Mickey. I actually, it's just being a bit of a, a pain. <laughs> I had I know. Push some I know. Buttons. It was it was quite funny. It was quite funny. I enjoy that stuff. I enjoy that stuff. For sure, a comment from uh, from Mick from Tamara saying um, yeah. saying what you had in the glass. And anyone that is joining us, please let us know what you've got uh, in your glass for the evening, or or if you've got a, a mug of tea or something as you're just winding down, getting uh, geared up for a dram. Um, let us know what you got, um, Mick. I think you you slipped off just before we started. I wasn't sure. I you went I, off to I think I come back just about fine, didn't I? Yeah, you just yeah. made it. Yeah, Carl said I'm starting anyway. We'll see what we we'll see what he does. Uh, but you, you went away to concoct something in the kitchen, haven't you? So what have you yeah, done? so I, I've done a, a quick, and it was quite quick, uh, a quick twist on on a Tom Collins. So everybody knows that's gin based. Uh, we do do a gin. However, I, I've used um, our Vitton, our new make spirit, uh, to replace the gin. Uh, all I've done to add that is, um, so I've done uh, a nice cheeky house double um, of the Vitland, about 15 mil of sugar syrup, about 30 mil of uh, lime juice as opposed to lemon juice, and, and topped it up a wee bit with some uh, soda water. Normally I would garnish that with uh, a slice of lime or a slice of lemon or something, but I was in a rush to get back to the screen to do this. Um, I just ripped a part of my mint, uh, my mint plant off. Um, so we're going to see how that goes. So uh, I've got a, I, I don't know, we're not going to call it a Tom Collins because it's remotely, it, it sort of follows the same sort of vein, but it's not. So we'll call it a, we'll call it a Mickey Plummer, why not? Uh, and it's garnished with mint. So, uh, so, uh, Skoll. Skoll. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's quite cheeky. I like that. I like that. And I've got a few, uh, few single cask McMira's lined up as well, uh, which will, uh, which we'll discuss uh, later on as we go through. But I suppose now we've got the drinks and that out of the way. People, please keep finding what you're having to drink this evening when you, if you're joining us. Um, I suppose we better find out a little bit about Jess. Uh, Jess, who are you? What do you do? Tell us about yourself. Um, hello, I am Jess. Um, I'm really pleased to see actually just scrolling across the bottom that Carl is supporting my home nation and having a Yorkshire tea. That's very pleasing. Um, <laughs> I work for Single Cask Nation. We are independent bottlers. Um, Ta-da, single cast nation. Um, we have, uh, we're entering into our 10th year. This is our 10th anniversary year. Um, and up until 2019, um, single cast nation only existed within the US. 
Um, there's just three of us in the company. My boss is uh, uh, Joshua Hatton and Jason Johnston Yellen. Um, and together we are the three J's, obviously like the three amigos, but with better whiskey. Although I, I, maybe we need to get some sort of hats or something to make it, I don't know, I'll work on that. Um, but yeah, so uh, they um, handle all of our US stuff. Um, my official job title is Global Sales Manager. But as uh, we were chatting before we came on air, um, it involves a bit of everything. So um, they deal with uh, North America um, and pretty much um, I get to play with the rest of the world. So I get the UK, Europe, and what we call rest of the world, um, which again, we should definitely find something a little bit more eloquent. But um, it means that I get to help pick casks um, and bottles and stuff and sell some really delicious whiskeys and generally chat whiskey with people who are really into whiskey. There's, there's not many better jobs to be doing. That does sound you've got a free range of the rest of the world apart from North America, mate. That, you know, that's, that's a pretty big playground, really. Yeah, it is. Um, I like to make this naff joke that I've made about a thousand times by now about um, obviously Beyonce's got it right. It's women that run the world. So that's why they've left me all the other markets and they've just <laughs> North America for themselves. Why not go own it? Own it if you got it, you know? Yeah. So um, I get to do that. And then outside of my single cast nation hat, I've been running a tasting company with my best friend for about eight years. So um, we do a lot of whiskey tastings um, in the UK and we travel a little bit with them too, or well, used to. Um, and during lockdown, we've gone from hosting one tasting a month, um, which we do in the Bonacord pub in Glasgow, big shout out to them, um, to twice a month online. Um, and in our new lockdown, somebody emailed and said, are we going to move this to like a weekly meeting? <laughs> no, I can't. That's too much. I can't. <laughs> That's... What's, your, what's, your, what's your tasting company called? So we were the Lynch Whiskey, but we are now, uh, we go by Scandi uh, Whiskey Tastings which made a lot more sense when we were traveling to Scandinavia all the time. But um, <laughs> now that we are grounded in Glasgow is a little bit harder to understand. Um, but we have um, we have our own uh, logo, which is a Dala Hest. And that's uh, probably, I imagine, on Mickey's list later to grill me on. Um, so yeah, no. my is pretty much... No, no grilling involved, pal. No grilling involved, I'm sure. <laughs> like tough questions, you know. Um, yeah, my life is pretty much whiskey, which is crazy because my parents don't drink. So they, <laughs> when I started doing this all the time, they were a bit like, mm. especially my mum, very kind of sceptical, like, because I, I think she doesn't, it, with nice, you know, nice whiskeys, you're not... You're not guzzling them, and you said mm. I certainly can't afford to guzzle nice whiskies. Um, so yeah, she's she's come around to it, but she was this is not the path I was supposed to go down, and so she was a bit at first. Um, well, no, that is quite unusual for somebody with two law degrees, really. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was going to come to that as a yeah, my my two. I should put them on the wall, then at least they've got some purpose instead of just being in a cupboard. Um, <laughs> nice, nice whiskies, though, aren't aren't just about the drinking. I mean, it's not about the drinking is about the enjoying isn't Absolutely. It? So I think that if you can communicate that to your parents eventually um you know exactly. maybe they'll get on board and your christmas presents will become a bit more specific well, i have to say it is entirely their fault that i'm fascinated by this stuff um when we were kids we used to go on holiday to the northeast of scotland uh because you know when you live in yorkshire uh, where else would you go on holiday apart from the northeast of scotland and it rains a lot up there funnily enough um, and you need to have something to do with two small children in an age before the internet and really before a decent TV. Um, so they used to take us to all sorts of, there's a lot of castles up there. Um, but my favorite thing to go to was always Glenfiddich Distillery because I was fascinated with it from a very early age, like the smells and you yeah. know, the copper and like shiny and the amazing tour guide, it was a great experience. And, you know, so, I mean, my parents were trying to punt me to them from the age of about seven. Like, she'd she really love to work here. Please take her away. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we moved on from child slavery by that point, Jess. Yeah. <laughs> and I, it was very much like a, we'll pay you to take her away. <laughs> right, okay. Um, a, a reverse paid internship. <laughs> yeah. Please, just, we've had enough of her. Um, so, yeah, like, I, that, the fascination of kind of the science and the history and the story of the industry was a big love of mine well before I started drinking it. Um, I had two friends at university who their dads were really into whiskey and we just, just decided um, we were working, or two of us were working in an off license selling whiskeys that that's what we would, you know, we should learn some more about this because it's really interesting. Um, and they just brought stuff from their dad's cupboards and, you know, various people donated bottles for us to try. So as a, a grown up drinking 
well, a student drinking, you know, we were on like, I remember one night we had one of the Brookladdy Lynx bottles. Um, I remember my other friend brought Cragamore from a really early stage because his grandpa loved Cragamore. So that was in his house. We had Cragamore. Um, I loved Dallas Do because, you know, I'm, I'm really cheap to keep. So Dallas Do was. <laughs> um, and we were very lucky that there were two phenomenal whiskey pubs in Aberdeen at the time. One that sold whiskey at a very cheap price. Um, the Prince of Wales was very reasonably priced and had a phenomenal bar. And then if we were feeling a little bit fancy and we had a bit more money, then we would be drinking in the grill um, who have an equally, and it's a very beautiful building inside there too. Mm. And that's where I first had Octomore and the first Supernovas and like okay. some really kind of big, big whiskey that changed how I was looking at it. And at that time I was selling early Octomore. So, you know, it was great to be able to say, well, I've tried this. And so it's kind of how it grew. And then I realized that Actually, I really like this a lot more than the stuff I was supposed to be doing. And um, yeah, so <laughs> sidetracked into the industry that way. Um, you found your passion. Your passion found you, you know, uh, the, your path, I guess. Sounds like to yeah. me. Yeah. And it's, it's a really, it's a social thing to have. Like, the industry is really social. Everybody, even if you don't like whiskey, everybody has an opinion on it. I've never met anyone who, when they ask what I do, they're like, oh, Okay, well, yeah, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so, what um, that entail? yeah, and, and I think it's 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 nice. So even even though my parents, you know, they don't quite get it, they're really supportive. They're not, you know, looking at me like we will just next year we'll review and maybe send you to AA. But I mean, like this year, my mum bought me a bottle of the Lagavulin for Shield for my birthday, which is oh, nice. nice. So she uh, embraced. She she has really embraced it then. Do you know what I mean, so you know, you, you know, if you're trying to guide somebody away from something, you don't tend to buy them something yeah. to do with you, what you're trying to guide them away from, really. Yeah, yeah, you know. Well, they're, de they're definitely not trying to get me away from it because if that was when I graduated from Aberdeen, I said I was going to go to Harriet Watt and become a distiller. And my mum said, I really think you should finish your legal degree. And it's the only time in my life I've listened to her. So I did my legal diploma and then I was like, I wasn't getting traineeships and it was really miserable. So I, I just kept up with the whiskey stuff instead. So. Here I am, many years later. I was just saying, here you are now. You know, yeah. uh, I, I didn't realise actually, Jess. You know, all, in all the time that I've known you and we've spoken and everything like that, I didn't actually realise single cast nation was just the three of you. Yeah, we we're really, you know, we're cool gangsters. We make it look like there's a herd of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's just it's, it's, so. Go, go take a twist on the old uh, analogy, like the the, the old uh, the small drunk man in the pub. I would I would hit you. I hit you so fast that many times you think you were surrounded. <laughs> yeah, we have. I must I must admit we have, um, especially in the US, and it's growing here because obviously people are getting to know us this side of the pond as well. In the US, we have a fantastic nation base who are very loyal, very loving. I knew Single Cast Nation before I started working for them. I knew Josh and Jason for quite a long time. Um, they used to, we used to have a, sh uh, a whiskey festival, a whiskey show called Whiskey Jubilee, which always makes people laugh. Um, but it, um, it was really like a massive family gathering every time, you know, and I've met people all across um, the, the US who would travel to the different shows. Um, and it's got a really lovely family feel. We have a very active um, private Facebook group, which is lovely. People chat whiskey all the time and like, um, they will help each other in different states get bottles, which I think is just really wonderful that, you know, some, yeah. something people like going to one of these dusty out of the way liquor stores and be like, oh, we saw um, one of the guys had put up pictures of a Laphroaig 10 year old, which we bottled a long time ago. I'm amazed that's still on retail. And he put it up and he was like, this in the store, you guys, if you want it, I'll help you get it home. And so they're really, they're fantastic. They're a great, great group of whiskey drinkers who just want to learn more and it's very friendly so it, it's it's really lovely to be welcomed with complete open arms into such it's a, a community. people well it's a community isn't it that, that you guys have got over there starting to say everybody um I, i'll check the forum sometime and i've you know looked at the facebook page and, and see everyone sort of chatting away and it is um sort of quite a tight-knit and very welcoming um place which isn't often the case or always the case with uh, with some whiskey groups i think yeah. Um, uh, everyone's sort of very open-minded and kind, um, at least from what I've seen. Anyway, I don't know if you've seen yeah. sort of more of it, but for me, they're really pretty good at um, self-policing. What I like is that there's there's nobody kind of coming in and throwing their weight around. You know, there's some very experienced drinkers in there with phenomenal collections, but they welcome the new starts. And you can come and ask questions. Like, you know, I always say asking questions is really important. Whether you know you're training someone for a job or you're teaching them about whiskey, like there really should never be any stupid questions. There are things you can ask that we're going to laugh, 
but you're going to learn why we're laughing. I, I yeah, would yeah. never, I would never stop something like I. I was listening to an interview with someone who talked about in the drinks industry, there's a tendency to a kind of like gatekeeping where it's like, oh, we know these things. You don't know these things, so you can't come in. Mm, but yeah. I definitely find whiskey on the whole is very welcoming. Like, you want to come and learn? Sure, I'll pull you a dram. Let me tell you about this. So like Mickey's mentioned, and I, I kind of, I knew about the Aberfeldy, that's sort of why I picked it. But, um, you know, like, <laughs> what's this label that you recognize? Well, let me show you something that may change your opinion on it. Um, mm. You know, you've seen in a supermarket, you've seen in the bar what they have behind a bar. What does that what does it taste like? What does something different from them look like? So it's a great opportunity to share what you have. And that's a big joy for me with whiskey is not only getting to learn more, but to be able to to pass it on to someone who maybe didn't have that. You yeah, know, that's that's about the Whiskey Jubilee, um, which for, for anyone that, that, that doesn't know, that, that is a, a play on words because you're, you're, the, the parent company is called <laughs> is it the, the Jewish Whiskey Company. Yeah, and that was the original branding. We've changed it a little bit since then. But yeah, we initially started out as the Jewish Whiskey Company. Um, and whilst so the next question that always gets asked is like, are you Jewish? I'm not. Um, you don't need to be Jewish to drink our whiskey. We've never actually pursued down the line of getting kosher certification. Um, the early bottles were aimed more at bourbon because sherry is problematic, um, whereas bourbon's not. Um, but we now have said that just to trip ourselves up, we've just done a, a kosher rum for Passover. Um, but it's it's not a regular feature of our bottlings. But the Jubilee festivals were kosher catered events. So that if you were kosher keeping, you could attend and not be limited by anything. But if you weren't a kosher keeping, you didn't, you know, didn't even need to be Jewish, you would have just gone there and had a fantastic time. They were some of the best festivals I've attended because they were so open. Um, they had a very strict policy. They wouldn't send, they wouldn't allow brands to send models to tables, which they let me in. So, I mean, it's okay. But um, they, you know, it was all the emphasis was on having knowledge that you didn't want to have an attendee go up to a table and say, oh, you know, tell me about this or ask a question. Uh, and then to just be like, and either reading off like a little fact sheet or not have an answer. So yeah, like yeah. It, it was really I, th I think we need a little bit more of that at events. It was like a kind of thinking man's event rather than a free-for-all drinking event. And will we see it come over here to the UK anytime? I know, you know, maybe not this year perhaps, but uh, is, it, <laughs> is it any potential for it? I, I would be interested in seeing if we could do some format. I mean, like, obviously, that all depends what this looks like. Um, it's on hiatus in the US at the moment just because we were doing three shows and it takes a huge amount of work and each of the different cities across the US um and with all the other projects we had going on uh we have an ethos of you know if you're going to do something you should do it properly and rather than have people being like oh but the early shows were better you know it's always it's always better to leave them wanting more than being like oh, yeah. and but i you know like jokingly i've been saying i'm going to start a petition i'm going to get the nation members to run their own show so that if my bosses decide they don't want to do it i'll get it run by the nation it wouldn't be a problem we could do it um, whether or not I get their blessing is a different story and the answer to that is <laughs> but yeah, I, I I would love to see it come back in some format when whatever gatherings of people end up looking like. Mm. We could probably get like Tottenham Hotspur or something like that to, to sponsor the event as well. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there are various, there's fairly big communities here. Um, there is, yeah. Not, not so much in Glasgow, maybe Giffnock, but um, Manchester and London, certainly there are mm. sizable communities. But like I say, um, the intention wasn't ever to create, you know, like a specifically kosher. Um, like I say, I'm not Jewish. I don't have any heritage of it. Um, but it was like a kind of, as a bonus. It all started off the back. Um, Joshua had a blog. So how my bosses met each other was they had whiskey blogs back in the days when people did that. And he's, his blog was Jew Malt. So he covered some Jewish stuff, but not specifically. And it kind of carried on from there. Um, it's quite yeah, yeah I, I met so two both bloggers, I think, wasn't it? And then um yeah. sort of had, I had their intro story. It's a bit like a kind of meet cute in a rom com. You know, <laughs> they're like, we could do this. And at that time there was nobody in the US um bot independently bottling whiskies on any scale, but as a community to get people involved, you know, obviously there were IBs out there, but not um in quite the same way. So they had a conversation ten years ago on Thanksgiving where Joshua called Jason and was like, I think we should do this. We should make it to a business. So here we are 10 years later. So cheers to that. Yeah, cheers to this is this is pleasing me so much. I it's not very often you see Aberfeldy at this age independently bottled. 
<laughs> no, it's not. And, and that's what I like about independent bottlers such as yourself, and that Jess is, you know, there's there's an abundance uh, of distillery bottlers out there for certain people, but it's really quite rare to go, well, do you know what's, and as, as everybody knows, that's made up of lots of casks normally. You know, you, you very rarely see a, a single cask uh, from from a distillery. That, you know, it's become a bit more popular these days, but, you know, mm -hmm. on general, you know, there still is not a lot of it out there. So to see uh, single casks from distilleries that you like, uh, and, you know, you can blind taste these things and go, that's from a distillery you really like, and, taste it and go, doesn't taste anything like it. You know what I mean, yeah. but you know, it's, it's it's good to get into those component parts, though, isn't it? Really? No, oh, completely. And I think um, I would love to come on and be like, yeah, I've only got in my warehouse. We only have 1960 Springbank. I'm kicking around 70s Ardbeg, bag, and I like so much McCallum. We don't know what to do with it. And <laughs> it, there are some of it available, but we try to create whiskies that are we are whiskey geeks, so we want to put stuff out that we want to drink. Um, we frequently talk about being kind of uh, mouthfeel guys. We're always looking for whiskies that do something interesting on your palate. And that's not necessarily tied into the age or the cask it came from um, or a, a certain you know brand. So when we're bottling at cask splits, we're looking for that. And that gives you the option. You can dilute that. Yeah. Um, you can just go with what we, we have picked with our palates to see whether or not that works. Um, I saw John asked a really good question. Um, what makes whiskey not kosher? Um, as a non-expert, there are two kind of points here. One is for it to be kosher certified, it has to have had approval by a rabbi who's examined the whole process. Um, and it goes to a rabbinical council and they produce a certificate saying your processes and your product is clean. Um, and it's to do with the principle of mixing grape and grain. So obviously barley is bourbon. So that's bourbon is already made from barley. And you're just putting kind of more of the same, albeit from a different country, into a cask. Um, sherry is obviously made from grapes. Um, yeah. And there is a statistical argument, depending how um, orthodox you are, very highly orthodox, won't touch anything in a sherry cask. Um, and then some people will talk about um, that any sherry content left in a cask is incidental. It's it's not designed to be there. It's just what's in there. And it's this, I think I'm going to get caught here. I think it's a 60th of a 60th. If it's less than that, then it's it's deemed to be passable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I, I have lots of lovely Jewish non kosher keeping friends who will drink Macallan sherry cask until the <laughs> fall. So, um, there, what I, one of the things that's always fascinated me as a, a passing by of the idea of it, somebody told me very early on, is if you can justify it between you and your God, then because the rabbis will disagree. So you can side with one rabbinical. Um, ideal if it suits you <laughs> compared to the others. Yeah. Um, there are obviously general principles that are very strictly adhered to, but there's always a little kind of wiggle room. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's part of the reason we don't pursue kosher certification is that it's a, it's a little bit of extra work and it's not really, we, if we were seeking to be a, a kosher brand, then obviously we would be going and chasing that. Um, but I suppose it, it might just be easier then for. Um, the non-kosher keeping people to, to get hold of sherry bombs a bit more easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A few, few less people after them. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, of the Jewish faith, but I, my cousin Brendan from um, the Isle of Mull, uh, who I talk about every now and then with, with Mick, um, met a lovely uh, Canadian girl who is um, Jewish, uh, and they got married in, in Vancouver, I think 2017, 2018, we went, we went over there. The, the whole clan went over. We had um, they had to fly in a rabbi from the states because nowhere no rabbi in Vancouver would marry um, would marry them because you know he wasn't Jewish. But we got yeah. to go over there. We've got so I've got my family tartan uh, a yarmulke in my Love. family tartan that all of our all of the cousins were given, and um, uh, they had uh, my cousin Brendan was with in his kilt and up on the chair uh, up in the air. And we were doing that. I don't know what the song is, but I, I can hum the melody that. <laughs> Um, we did all of that going around, and it was, uh, I don't, if, if I've got anyone else, friends or family watching, I'm sorry, uh, to rate weddings in this way, but it was the best wedding that I've ever been to. It was it was so good. It was such a wonderful integration of, of both cultures as well. Um, they had the, the hooper, that house, yep. you know, this wooden frame you get married under. My cousin is a, a, a boat builder, he's a, a woodworker, so he he built that, and now they, they rent that out to you know, other people getting married now as well. Oh. They had um they had the you know the, the the hand tying so they had some Celtic stuff in there and then the the smashing of the glass and things and um yeah it was it was the best wedding I've ever been to 
I just uh, I want someone else in my family to find a nice Jewish person to get married to, so we can do it. <laughs> so do it yeah. I've always um, thought it's a great mixture, like the Scots bringing fantastic drinks, but the food. Oh my God, the food is so like I, that was one of the things I used to secretly enjoy the most about the festivals as an exhibitor. You would be assigned a showrunner who just spent the whole show feeding you, and oh, some of the food! If I could have brought these guys back with me and just installed them in the kitchen, <laughs> just some of the best food I've ever eaten. Just nothing fancy and high end, just like delicious stuff you would imagine is just endlessly brought to you, like this amazing pastrami and bagels. And no, I, I, I think we should, we should, uh, I think we should lobby your bosses, Jess, really, and uh, I think we should get a you know Jubilee UK edition definitely up and running. I'm always up for a bit of peer pressure, you know. I like to start my meetings with them on a kind of dicey note, like, by the way, I'm organising a group of people to probably go against what you're about to say next. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting it out there, do with it what you may. <laughs> you talk about the food. Um, I've been listening to the podcast. So I, I started from the beginning. Um, I haven't heard any of the more recent ones, and I believe that you've, you've joined the fray now that you're part of the team. So I think you're, you're on a podcast here or there, or, or most yeah. of them. I'm um, actually on the very first podcast was done at the Jubilee in Seattle. Okay. Uh, they interviewed me at uh, the stand that I was running with my old job, which when they first said I was going to be in the podcast and I listened back, I actually can't hear myself because I appear to have adopted some sort of disgusting Atlantic twang. <laughs> sound American. Try, trying to fit I must have heard that, but I, didn't, I wouldn't have recognized yeah. your voice from it. I, wouldn't have done, I, had to, I had to go and ask Joshua for the time codes of where I was in the show. Well, are you sure I'm in there? I think you, you put me in the director's cut and left me out of the main one, yeah. Um, the most um, difficult thing about listening to it is is hearing about all these releases that come out, but then and that you're never going to try and all these just yeah. delicious sounding whiskeys. But then the food as well, when they talk about the food at the festivals, both of them sound so um, like genuinely enthusiastic about like the quality of the food that's there. And um, I, don't, I haven't been to many whiskey festivals where the food is like... Well, you know, there's, there's food there and it's present and it's good and you've, you've had a drink and it's all tasty, but uh, they sound really, really into it, I think. They are. And it's done properly. They get fully, they go through great pains to find proper kosher uh, caterers to come in and do it. Um, and it's all overseen officially and made sure that everything is tickety boo and up to scratch. And it just, yeah, you're right. And I, I wonder, maybe that would help in a, a new way of looking at festivals because I wonder if sometimes people are intimidated by whiskey festivals because there's a lot of drink and then quite often not a lot of space to go and do like a sit down and a reflect or get something to eat um like I am a massive beer nerd and a lot of beer festivals are getting a lot better they quite often will have great like kind of pop-up um uh, street food vendors yeah. and I, I think that's changing in beer festivals that I've been to over the more recent years that there's more of an emphasis on like this is a really great beer and you could have it with some food and you can pair these two things. And I think for me, I still sometimes struggle with the idea of pairing food and whiskey because for me, whiskey is such an experience on its own. But I don't necessarily want it to be tied into something else. And I have to kind of like, you know, rework the way I'm thinking about a dram to, um, you know, to put it with food. But yeah, you're right. Maybe we should. All right. I'll write, I'll write that down. You know. <laughs> Agenda list number one. Single whiskey festival. Oh, is John, is John talking about my my family wedding? I think maybe. Yeah, that probably. With it. Yeah, just just a week. I think we should have that now going forward. Uh, a corner of the pub called the Wee Rich Ramble. <laughs> <laughs> it was just I had such a good time. I'm just reliving it, talking about it now. So talk, talking about good times, Jess. You recently uh, uh, with, with with some friends and that took part. You've got a project 1989. Care to uh, indulge us with that? I do. So, um, that's the. This is so. I should probably explain from the beginning. This Dalai. I love that. I love. I love that picture. By the way, just with, with, the Glen Cairn. Yeah, with yeah. the Glen Cairn. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> when Chris and I came to redesigning um, our tasting company, um, we were the Lynch, which obviously, as whiskey aficionados, we know what a Lynch is. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to make that look artistically appealing without it looking somewhat rude. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it can be a bit phallic-like, can't it, really? Yeah, um, and uh, obviously um, it doesn't necessarily translate very easily, so we were kind of scratching around to try and find something else. Do horses have thumbs? Oh, I don't know. Um, we were trying to find something else, and we were doing a lot of stuff with um, kind of Scandi groups at the time, and I was looking for something really iconic, and I kind of thought about it accidentally. I've been obsessed with Dalahess since I was very small. My granny had one. 
Um, we have a kind of family sort of connection to Scandinavia and Nordic countries. Um, and I've loved them. And it's been a running joke my whole life that my parents, despite the fact that they love me very much, have never actually bought me a pony. And so now I'm a grown up with no pony. And that's, you know, heartbreaking. Every <laughs> I thought, what would be the best gift I could give myself? I'll buy my own pony. Um, and obviously the Dalahest is very iconic. Um, although it's more associated with Dalana, um, the region of Sweden, it's every Swedish person recognizes them. And basically anyone who's ever been to Ikea will also have seen them. Um, and so I approached a friend of mine who's a graphic designer and I said, do you think we could incorporate this to be a bit kind of more whiskey in some way? Like, I don't want to go kind of, don't want to stereotype it one way or another. And I also don't want to get sued by Glen Cairn for stealing their um, their glass. So Tom kind of chewed it over and then explained what Dollar Hest were. And so um, that's how Sven was born. Um, he sent me back this picture. And the first edit he did of the Dollar Hest, he doesn't have a smile. But Tom was like, oh, I've got a second thought and gave him like a smile. And he just became like almost like a children's character, I think. <laughs> um, Fantastic. Sorry. Not, did did I just hear you mention a name there? You, you've actually named him. Yes, I was I was gonna tell you the I'll give the abbreviated version. Chris really gets annoyed by how much I love this thing. Like it's I'm so proud of it, ridiculously proud of it. Um and we were doing a tasting in uh northern Sweden uh for a group. Um and the actually the place we were doing the tasting was above a stables. And after the tasting, we were staying there and we kind of got talking about um all sorts of stuff. And I said, Oh, we've got this logo and he needs a name. And I was like, What's the weirdest name horse that lives at the stable? So we started and as a child, I rode, so we were swapping like stupid names. I was like, well, he's he's Swedish, so he needs to have a very Swedish name. So I think Sven. And I was talking to Adele, Jenny, and she was like, yeah, but if he's really Swedish, it's going to be hyphenated. It's really common for names to be like two parts. And I was like, well, what would you put after Sven? And she didn't even hesitate. She was like, Canute. And I was like, what? <laughs> And that's how fun. Yes. And the answer to what's the strangest name horse in the stable uh, was Mr. Pikachu, like the Pokemon. And I was like, well, if we didn't have Sven, I'd probably call him Pikachu. So he became Sven Canute Pikachu. And then uh, Chris said that we should name the horse after him. And he's, he's really Emil. So um, obviously the way uh, Scandi Simmons is going to happen. So he's Sven Canute Pikachu Emilson. So he has a name that's much bigger than he is. But I love it. And he's he much bigger than Sweden, mate, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, oh, it's that's fantastic. It's, um, it's like the dressing up box I never had. So, like at Christmas, we gave him a Santa hat. Um, for Project 89, obviously, he had like a party hat. Um, yeah, um, it, it got a bit ridiculous. So, when we turned 30, we decided that we should do a, a mega whiskey celebration thing. Uh, Chris and I, as you know, are hugely competitive. And uh, what started out as this idea, we should drink whiskey from our birth year, turned into, I'll give you the short version and we'll point no fingers, because he's not. <laughs> um, he not even defend himself, Jess, come on. We should, we should have 30 whiskeys from our birth year because we were turning 30. And I was like, this is the best idea ever. I'm such a genius. And because it's two of us, it'd be really easy. We'll collect 15 each. And we'd had a couple of drams and we were on Isla when we came up with this. And the morning after, he was like, uh, are we still doing this? And I was like, yeah, great idea, great idea. And he was like, just letting you know that um, I already have 45 bottles of 1989 whiskeys. And I was like, what, what? I've been duped. I'm <laughs> starting to scratch and you're already, he's like, I'll sell you some if you can't. And I was like, no. So uh, by hook and crook, I managed to get my allocation. So that's how that started. And then we just, because we traveled a lot and, we started telling people about this stupid idea we'd had. So many people were immediately like, we'll, we'll be there. And I was like, oh, oh, so this isn't going to be like a party. It just became this epic saga. And we kind of decided we were going to, we would be on Isla because we both love PT whiskeys. And that each day of the week, so we were going to go for a week. That was fairly early established. Each day we would go to a different distillery and do something at a different distillery. So um, it kind of turned into like a, mini fashion and people flew in from all over the world like i can't can't tell you what an amazing week that was especially in light of the fact that we've now spent a year in lockdown that's an yeah. even better send-off for 2019 um we had friends flying from the us canada there was like half of sweden and um, friends from the uk and it was just just like out of this world that people wanted to come and celebrate this 
slightly ridiculous idea we had. <laughs> um, I think you guys have a picture because when I go in on something, I do it properly. Um, I had artwork created, so here we go. Um, I had this idea that I wanted like a Where's Wally type image. So that this was made <laughs> into a postcard. This was made into a postcard that I sent out to people. Um, so my two bosses are here on the far left of the screen. Um, they're sort of laughing. Jock has got his arm around him. Um, Chris and I are in the middle and then various other figures. And then if you start looking at the picture, there's lots of other funny in jokes so there's obviously all the distilleries up at the back we've got a swedish summer house uh we've got planes because we were traveling um there's a little lion if you can see that kind of two-thirds of the way up on the right they're all yeah. over the streets in stockholm they're like bollards but i'm sort of obsessed with them and um, there's lots of bits of food down here at the front drinks there is a valinch there um yeah so um we hired a, a designer in glasgow a really talented guy called Sean and we just gave him a list of stuff we wanted out of a picture and this is pretty much exactly what he came back with actually um yeah, top right corner is that the the, the church at Bermore yeah, and uh right. is that a, a little Mac Mirror Easter egg in the roof or is that <laughs> sort of looks like it actually it's quite good because um your show screen has got Mac Mirror it looks like it's in the roof like I've designed that in so yeah I'll pretend wow. Uh -huh. Is that just uh, imposed over our logo yeah. there, and it's meant what? to be just a black roof? Oh, it is, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That's actually <laughs> that's actually not part of Jess's picture. Oh, that, that's not what normally yeah. there, Fletch. Yeah. I thought maybe so go, have taken that and just yeah. stuck it in to sneak it in a bit of subliminal marketing. No, yeah. so, <laughs> uh, Cole's mocking you now. He's making it a flash. <laughs> Put it in, and then got you guys to sponsor my week. And I love yeah. missed the trick. You, you, you um, missed something there, Paul. That's for sure. You, yeah. you, mentioned, there. you mentioned Valinch again there. We had a, a comment from Natalie um, just saying uh, she must not be an aficionado because she's not sure what a, a Valinch is. I think you can be a whiskey aficionado and, and not know what all of the lingo is, I'd say. Um, but but um, would, would one of you care to explain um, what a Valinch is? I was going to say, it doesn't make you swallowing. <laughs> oh, okay, um, cool. The, um, a valinch is the metal tube which is used to take uh, samples out of a cask. They also have other names for them. They do I mean, have lots of other names, yeah. They get called um, dog and uh, whiskey thief, but they're very rudimentary. The essential yeah. is it's a long pipe and you put your thumb over the end so the air traps. It's trapped and it you draw the whiskey up and that's how you take it out of the cask. And so um, gen so generally, yeah. As, no, good, as, Jeffrey. There's, there's lots of great kind of olden skullduggery stories about distillery workers helping themselves out of casks by bits of um, piping they would hide down their trousers. You know, they'd take out the cask and then it'd be, you know, hidden in a boot or in a paint pot or, yeah, the, the stories of the olden days, the Wild West of the industry. So avalanches, um, you probably will have seen them. They get There's lots of pictures in marketing. Um you may just not have known that's what they're called, and that's yeah. okay. And like, like Jess said, you know, that they, they did come under lots of different names, really. And uh, a Valinch is probably the more official term for the official drawing of the cask for some. I mean, whiskey thief, whiskey thief isn't the official name. No, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> not rich. No, that's generally what Jess was referring to by people, you know, distillery workers, etc. You know, yeah. uh, or that's that's you know where where copper dog. You know what I mean? They used to. The, the coppersmiths, when they used back in the day, when they used to have on site coppersmiths and stuff, used to make the guys up. Uh, I've, got, I've got one knocking about somewhere. Uh, and that's what they used to call they were, they were dipping dogs, basically. It used to be on, uh, it reminds me of like a, like um, a big bullet casings, basically, uh, that they would dip in. It'd be on the end of chains. Uh, they would dip that into the cask, take it up, and that would then, the, the part of the chain would hang over their belt, uh, and the dipping dog would, would then rest down by the side of their legs. So when they're walking out, uh, the distillery, etc., smuggling their uh, their ill-gotten gains, shall we say, uh, out. So yeah, lots of different names for them, but yeah, but Avalanche is probably the. Uh, there you go, perfect. Uh, oh. Your thumb would, your, your fingers would go into the two hoops at the top. Uh, your thumb would go over the top. You'd put the the unincorporated end, uh, the bit without any down uh, into the cask. You'd suck up a little bit first. Put your thumb over the top. Um, and then you can pour samples, a perfect example there, uh, or you can literally shake it up and down with your thumb and, and, and keep um, pressure in it with, with your thumb and that as well. Yes. Yeah, oh, cool. yeah. So, yeah, so so Natalie knew what it was, but just knew a different name for yeah. it because, as you said, there's dozens of different names out there. Yeah. yeah. So, so have you managed to complete Project 1989 then, Jess? Yeah, and we were um, due to have, like, a, an annual reunion, but obviously... 
Like there's, there's something going on that kind of put paid to that. Um, but we had a really lovely um, kind of Zoom sesh. So that moved through time zones. So obviously uh, started the guys out in mainland Europe, joined us to start with, and then the Americans as we went through the time zones all the way through to the West Coast, um, where we've got some friends in Seattle joined us and we, we stayed up talking. So that was, I think, the best we could do for a reunion. But um, yeah, sure. it came off much better than I ever thought we could. And each distillery was unbelievably generous to us with their time and the amount of shenanigans. I mean, like my shout out, probably for the ultimate, um, I, we went to Brookladi on the Wednesday and our friend, uh, Christian Grace or Kripper, as he's known, um, is a brand ambassador in Sweden for Brookladi and now Westland um, on a part-time basis. And I said to him, do you think we could, um, cause it's quiet season and there's probably no tours. Do you think we could just even just have a little gathering in the shop? And he said, look to me um, and what came out of it was insane. Uh, like, we had Mary had us up in the warehouse, and then Adam Hannock came down at lunchtime and just let us pretty much free reign in the warehouse. Nice. Um, and we, in our planning of Project 89, we sent a selfie to Crippa from a pub, which we, you know, a pub. So we may have had a drink or two, and we may have been doing duck faces that we sent in this picture. Um, and our faces have appeared on a village. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So it's that kind of picture. It's you know, um, we're on the bottle and it's me and Chris pulling a pretty stupid face, and that's pretty <laughs> awesome because we. Got, I was hoping we had that picture because it's actually really quite funny. I yeah. think I did send it. Maybe I spent far too long looking at pictures on my face to find you. <laughs> By the end, of well, I was like, awesome. I saw you got your face on one of those bottles. I think it's, yeah. I've, I've, I've thought about just just trying to apply for a job there just to get my face on the bottle once and uh, <laughs> have, have that have that in, in the, on the shelf for some time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're um, very, very special. So um, it, the whole thing was magical and very, very lucky to have such lovely people in my life that allow, that indulge my ridiculous whiskey shenanigans. So um, yeah. I think that's a good, that's, that's a good way of, of describing these people uh, is indulgers. Yes, for sure. Enablers. Um, I've just Enablers, switched, that's a better word. Yes. I've, um, I've switched whiskeys under here. I'm, I'm now, I'm now on brand. I'm doing so good. What have you got, Jess? Because I know you've got obviously a few friends in Sweden that are uh, cask owners at, at Macmillan, yeah. uh, and you get sent the occasional little gift. Yeah, if, if we're very well behaved and very nice. Um, I had an, so that's um, not very often then. <laughs> <laughs> it's so rude. Um, we, um, my friends organised an accidental smurgen advent calendar for Christmas, which was wonderful. Um, but I have pulled out McMira to stay on brand. So this is a private cast bottling that has been aged in the Bodus mines. Um, and it is a six-year-old and it's been in bourbon and it's a uh, rook, so it's smoky. Um, nice. it comes the lovely little cute bottles. Yes. I really love how they are like kind of exact imitations of the big ones, so that even down to the little dimples. Mm. Yep. Um, and this is just really lovely. Um, it's not too high. It's only 44.4%. So it's very quaffable for one of a, I don't know what the Swedish word for quaffable would be, I guess. It probably it probably looks the same on paper, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. But with an, with yeah. an umlaut over the A or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it'll be pronounced like, you know, not as uh, you pronounce it backwards i think yeah there you go that's what it was mm. so um yeah we've been working our way through this this is really nice so there's probably going to be people that are going only six years old in only 44 percent. but just to let you know guys the bonus mine uh is like 50 meters below ground it's got like 99 percent humidity so what happens with that is science basically i can't fully understand it and why it happens but basically we keep a lot of liquid volume but we lose abv quicker Basically, a, layman, yes. a layman's explanation, uh, one one step further before reaching any sort of formulas or equations or anything. But uh, because the humidity is so high, there's so much water already present in the air. So the, the water in the cask is in less of a rush to get out because you can't go above 100 percent. So it's not, you know, it's not the rush to get out. So ABV goes instead. And um, being a 30 litre cask, that would have come from, I assume, um, yeah. yeah, that sort of just accelerates and it exaggerates any sort of process that you have or any part of it. Yeah. Um, I've jumped off brand. I said that our manager was, uh, was wasn't watching tonight because he's on annual leave. But there is another one in the comments I've seen. But uh, I'm just going to sort of face up and uh, have to apologise afterwards, perhaps. But I've gone for one of yours, and it is John for 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 you to feel calm about uh, a ghost distillery. So um, it's uh, your imperial, your 24 year old. Um, Imperial, oh. my first ever Imperial. It was my first ever single cast nation bottling as well. 
and my first ever ghost distillery that I'd owned a, a bottle of. So for me, it was three and one, three birds in one stone, and uh, it's absolutely delicious. The um, other one I've got next to me is the Glen Elgin Ten, which is really good as well. But I've only just tapped into it a few days yeah, ago. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So they're both from our um, second release. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for your support. It's very uh, well, uh, no, cheers. Very my pleasure. Um, <laughs> super fast with that imperial because i so we talk a lot in about um how fast the releases in the us go um, and i'm looking i'm building building that here but the imperial disappeared off every retailer we put it into in under five minutes every time um the only two things we've sold faster than that recently um in the us uh on tuesday this week tuesday this week we put out um an invergordon 46 year old so there's a 45 year old in the uk release and a 46 in the us um and that was part of our online re release um and that went up at 12 12 on one of the, one of those like eastern times um and within a minute there were over 500 people on the site buying it the whole thing went in under two minutes wow crazy we knew it was going to be quick but we didn't realize it was going to be Quite so fast. The other thing that we sold a lot of is in this release we have a bourbon, um, which has oh, got because that's, yeah. that, that's got that's got a bit of an interesting tale to tell. Right, so right? this is um, this isn't a single cask, um, it's a small batch, and we split that between um, my markets and the US. Um, the US got twelve hundred bottles, and I managed to prize three hundred out of their hands. Um, and we put this online, and the 1,200 bottles went in under nine minutes in the US, which wow. is ridiculous. That's phenomenal, isn't it? You know what I mean? That is phenomenal. That's almost like Fajil bottling sort of speed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's quite fun to be part of that, but, I mean, the follow-up emails of people being... Oh, I dis disgruntled. It's a, a great thing. Um, James, yes, we um, do... I'll come back to the American stuff, but we do have single cask nation bottlings in Sweden. Um, my friends, the lovely Tommy and Peter of Svenska Eldvatten have imported it, and I know it is in the uh, warehouses for them. Um, and you can look them up on Facebook. I, or if not, after the show, I can send you um, a link so you can find them. Um, and I'm going to be doing a tasting in Sweden virtually. I'm raging because I love my Swedish trips. Um, I'll be doing that virtually from this couch right here. Um, so yeah, keep keep an eye on that. They um, are worth following on Facebook. They have lots of interesting mischief they get up to themselves. Um, but they're my Swedish guys. Um, but yeah, go back to the bourbon. Um, this comes from a distillery that we can't disclose on the label. But um, if you look at the label design, it should should give you a pretty good. Old... Have, have you done a have you done a, a wee a wee boutique take? Have you? I know. Can't quite can't quite name it, but there's uh, some some Easter eggs hidden in the labels there somewhere. So this this is a very famous distillery that had a very big fire in 1996, which we have got on the. This is pre fire stock from that distillery, so everybody in Bourbonland will instantly know what I'm talking about. So the the name of the distillery has two initials that are the same. That's probably about as much as I need to tell you. That's that's the rumor that I'd heard as well. Yeah, um, I was unaware of the fire. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's pre-fire stock, but it's spent 12 years in Kentucky and then it's come to Scotland and it's done 12 years of aging in the UK. So it's had a radical effect on the juice. That's the word one of my bosses says, juice. Um, it's had a radical effect on the maturation of the liquid because um, all that hot um, heat that you're used to in a bourbon at this kind of age, um, with some notable exceptions, generally you would expect to be drinking like pencil shavings, very mm, tannic, very, you know, um, but it's not like that at all. I think 12 years of it, much slower maturation in Scotland has given it a really rich, great kind of totally different um, character profile. It's really exciting to have this in the range to play with um, it's because it's really unusual. And single cast nation, what we do is we predominantly focus on scotch, but we also work with bourbons. We're famous for our wild turkey collaborations. Um, but we also, you know, we import milk and honey and penderin and you know not it's not all traditional scotch so. i'm 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 a bit upset there jess really uh because you know you've mentioned some great distilleries and you've got a big love for sweden uh but you didn't mention mac Mira. well i, I heard that there's a there was whisperings in the corridors whisperings it's been a, it's been a whisper or two i think i found um, some people from some other swedish distilleries have contacted us to tell us about their great products right <laughs> We'll so, uh, keep your ears peeled, guys. We've, we've got Jess nailed down now for uh, 
for a single cask nation bottling of Mac Miller. So stay tuned. I've got some up my sleeve for her, so it's not a problem. <laughs> I'm in so much trouble in my Tuesday meeting. Thanks. That's just, cool, mate. It's too early in the day for them to be watching and paying close attention to me. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, I, so Thomas there, uh, sorry, no, James, sorry, apologies, James, uh, was on about getting himself a cask from Sweden as well. Uh, one of our one of our good customers over here, so I've just changed over from my long drink to uh, to a single cask, 30 litre myself, Jess. I've gone, this is an ex Rosso, uh, our elegant recipe though, so a non-peated recipe. This is just over seven years old. This is 46.5%. Um, so New Union is a pub in Kendall. Uh, so big shout out to, to, to our man there uh, for that one. Uh, that's available through his, through his shop at the New Union uh, as well. I don't think there's many left if there's any left, actually, because this was one of only 47 bottles. Uh, uh, so our single cast program, you know, that company chose that from our... Uh, our private casks, uh, which used to be called our ready cask program, which are basically casks that are ready to bottle. Well, no, they just need another. Yeah, yeah, or or actually are sat there waiting just for some for some cool labels to go on. Really, yeah, cool labels and a, and a happy home to go to. Yeah. So, uh, what? what was that? That's just that's actually, old again. Yeah, an appeal. <laughs> So that was uh, that was the bell for last orders, guys. Uh, so that brings us to probably what's going to turn into our, our iconic question, Jess. And it's always aimed at our VIP patron, uh, and in this case, uh, it's you apparently. So, <laughs> so it's a, it's like what we call what what we like to call the whiskey scenario. So, what is your ideal whiskey scenario? Um, where are you? Who are you with, if anybody? And what's in the glass? More importantly, so I'm take it away. I really feel this kind of falls into the same category of like, you know, what's your favourite whiskey or pick your favourite child or, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not too far off that. Mine and Rich's changes like every couple of weeks in yeah. all fairness. I, I do too. I don't have a favourite whiskey. I have like a top five, but even that's kind of interchangeable. Yeah. Um, mm. Previously, I probably would have said um, uh, maybe in a warehouse somewhere. Um, I love being in Cadenhead's warehouses and doing cask mm. tastings. Um, but I love just being loose in a warehouse anywhere. Whenever I go to our bottling uh, place down in uh, beautiful Dumfriesshire, I always like to go and have a little nosy around the warehouse because it's just so evocative and the smell's amazing. Um, and maybe there's a cheeky thing you can borrow out the cask. Um, but I, I really think, um, given what a lovely time I've had in this pub tonight, I think probably, to me, it doesn't really matter where you are. It's being with people and having some good drums. Some of the best whiskies I've had are maybe things that you wouldn't necessarily look twice at, but it's about context of where you are. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. of my favourite Mac Mirrors that I have had um, come from my friends with their private casks, and we were up on uh, the shores looking into the sea. We had a little fire on. We were grilling sausages. Um, and just kind of like enjoying each other's company. So that's a get out answer, um, but it's mainly because I really miss other human beings and the well, pub. And, and that's the thing, you know, because we find we're, how we find ourselves at the moment, you know, uh, pretty much, you know, ver well, um, physically friendless. <laughs> Do you know I mean, virtually loads of friends, not a problem, but physically, <laughs> physically, not. physically friendless. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, everybody's my friend online, Jess. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just, it really, it's just when it's there round, it becomes a problem. <laughs> Physically friendless sounds like a terrible affliction. Like <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It does, yeah. doesn't it? But I'm, you know, uh, I've been so, drinking with people in in the in three D again because I've yeah. just been like this for you know the better part of a year. Maybe that's the next thing for Zoom to do uh, is is put it on the old Oculus or something like that. You know what I mean? Have have tastings on an Oculus. <laughs> yeah, three like D hologram style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, all sat down at the wrong problem. table and just looking up yeah, and down. Yeah talking to one another that's not a terrible idea mick maybe the three of us should collaborate i keep giving away all these great ideas on our shows right rich and i'm still <laughs> a poor man in east end of glasgow do you know what I mean? <laughs> i'm struggling to remember a previous good idea that you've had have you had other oh, good ideas that hurts rich that hurts you know <laughs> that hurts <laughs> brilliant but no Jess I mean that, that does sound lovely do you know what I mean just just with some pals and yeah you know, that is quite a, a, a big theme when we ask people this is you know we always know whiskies to be shared and stuff like that, but you know, my, mine is probably by myself in front of a fire, just like in the middle of nowhere in a wee cottage or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Maybe a bit some rugby on the telly, just sat there in front of the fire, watch a bit of rugby. I'm probably, I don't know, probably, a, a, sorry, Mac, but electric eating in the glass or something like that. Do you know what I mean? So, I, I think 
maybe before these times, my answer would probably have been along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But given that the most interaction I get these days is um, <clears throat> couriers bringing stuff to my door and asking me my name, uh, I, feel, I really feel with them because everybody must be answering the door's been like, yeah, that's my name. Let me tell you about everything else that I've done today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and how is your day, Mr. Postman? <laughs> Yeah, I, so I think yeah, I think maybe um, a moment of solitude somewhere, but being able to slip back into a party, maybe yeah. that's the best of both worlds with a good drum in hand. Like it, sounds good. like it. Right, uh, uh, that's that's us wrapping up for tonight, guys. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. Yes, been an absolute pleasure as always. Probably probably could have taken this on for about another three or four hours. Oh, <laughs> party. That's why I'm here. Like, you know. <laughs> we'll stick around with us for a moment afterwards, and we'll have exactly. that. And, and we'll, have, we'll have a we'll, we'll have a we'll have a debrief drum. All right, okay, yeah. Brilliant. Oh, so, guys, um, Rich, when are we back online? Uh, Monday, Monday, seven o'clock. Um, join us on our, our, our YouTube page. Uh, I think it should be going out on Facebook as well. Uh, we were joined by Moa Nilsson, uh, a Swedish whiskey girl, who will be. Uh, helping us uh, go through some uh, Rabbi Burns poetry on the night. I'm doing a Swedish twist on uh, on Burns night. And then um, the 10th, is it the 10th, Mick, for, for Valentine's? We've got um, some packs yes. to be coming live soon for that. We're at Core Range. We and in one of our moments um, being put in, usually we've got one of the seasonals as the extra. This time we've got one of the moments, the Prestige, which is our, uh, um, if you can call it, champagne cask, you know, champagne grape cask. Um, yeah, and that really, really... Nice one as well. So uh, Premier and Grand Cru grape casks. That's it. Yeah, really, really good. Much toasted wine and things. It's yeah, lovely that one. Um, and that's, we'll it. Too. that's the next two off the top of my head. But I'm sure we've yeah. got. No, we're back no, next no, Friday no. For, an, for another edition, uh, another pub oh. session, uh, and yes. we've got um, we Andy. Have Andy, Andy from that's right. yeah, Andy Duckworth, um, founder of the the Manchester Whiskey Club, and um, son of uh, Jack and Vera. Yeah, he's got yeah, he's got he's got his own uh, um, uh, YouTube channel now. He reviews all sorts of stuff. Got loads of followers and um, really really nice bloke. So um, yeah, he's coming to join us as our RVIP patron next Friday as well. So looking forward to that. So guys, uh, that's all we've got time for this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, no, I told you the boss was watching. I he told is you in. The boss was watching. He is in. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> that's all from us, guys. See you on Monday. If not, see you next Friday in the pub. Cheers, Skull. Skull. Cheers.